Good morning to all here in Annapolis, the state capital, as we are in the home stretch towards Passover. So a person never can lack enough good thoughts on the Haggadah to kick around with the family and friends and to mull over, because we know the Haggadah, I think the Haggadah has the, may have the all-time record for being the book that has the most books written on it. I don't know if there's too many other books that could uh, have to check with Guinness and all those people. Whatever it is, it's high on the list. There's just something about the Haggadah that just lends itself to a lot of interpretation of all kinds, and everybody has something to say. This has somehow, when they put it together, it just lends itself to have lots and lots and lots of meanings and possibilities, and sometimes it even seems like there's not a right or the wrong, there's just an endless... You know, whatever people say, you just seem, seem to, I want to say, get away with it, but there's a lot of room for thought. So, one of the first things we have in the Haggadah is, ma, there's a concept in the Gemara, in the Talmud, Maschil Bignus Umesayim Beshevach, that we begin with disgrace and we end off with praise. So, in a strictly halachic sense, this comes from a Mishnah in Psachim, and over there it's telling us that when you tell the Passover story, you start off with the part about the Jewish people, that's not so glorious. You start out that we came from pagans, that our forefather Avraham came from pagans, he was a pagan for a certain amount of years, <clears throat> you'll find differing opinions, but definitely for some amount of time, our grandfather was a pagan and our grandmother Sarah was a pagan. That's the way it is. We're not hiding it. It's all part of the glory. And then our grandfather Lavan, we had a lot of issues over there. There was almost came to, to blows over there with Lavan and our grandfather Yaakov. So in a halachic sense, it just means you start the Haggadah with the not-so-proud part, and you lead up with things get better, better, and better. And most people just say, okay, it's just a nice contrast, that's all. Because if you came from goodness and you become great, that's one thing. But if you came from down here and you wind up up there, ah, then you're even, you've overcome, you've overcome. But that's all okay. But the Alexander Rebbe, now, there were a few Alexander Rebbe's in Poland. I don't know if this is the one that lost his life in the Holocaust or not. But I have a feeling it is, Rabbi Yitzhak Isaac uh, from Alexander. So he has a beautiful thought. Now, being a realist, some now when you're a kid and you get to the Seder, usually you're upbeat. Because you're not worried about paying the bills, you're not the bottom line for making sure the house is supposed to be and that way it's supposed to be and everybody called. You're there, you'll enjoy. Hopefully some people coming over. You'll read something you learned in Hebrew school. You'll be proud of yourself, hopefully. All right. But for the adults, sometimes the Seder could be a little bit stressful for you the man or for the woman. And you get to the Seder and you look at the beautiful Seder table, but that table costs a lot. This Seder business, this Pesach business, I mean, it does, even if you cut corners, it costs. And then you start thinking about your job, and I don't know, and then, uh, and then am I really prepared for the Seder? Am I going to be able to say what I'd like to say? What's it going to be like over here? And you look around the table and you might think, oh boy, again, she's here, he's here. So Alexander Rebbe says it's very possible to step up to the Pesach Seder and look around and feel on not such a happy level, on a lowly level, on an unhappy level, and think like, oh, here we go again. So the Rebbe says if you let yourself, it is very possible, not necessarily magic, but you can start off on a low level and end up on a high level by the end of the Seder if you just let it, if you just let it. The Seder itself is a process and if you give yourself a chance to breathe it in you can approach the table not being in the best mood but as it goes by and if you're open to it, my wife likes to say that, if you're open to it then the Seder can resuscitate a person in many many ways and they can feel better afterwards, hopefully. 
No money back guarantees. But the Rebbe just says there's a good chance if you let it, it can do that for you. Well, there are many things in the Torah like that. But he says the special, this Pesach Seder has a very good power for that. And of course, that's a little bit Hasidic, reading subliminally into the words there, that you could start out on a disgraceful level and wind up on a praise level. But he says there's certain things in life, if you open up yourself, and you breathe into it, you let it into yourself, you could feel uplifted and a lot better at the end. A little bit like a spiritual massage, if you let it, if you let all the positive action come at you. Okay, I mentioned that Shul, that this is could be a very challenging Pesach for us, maybe even more so our Israeli brothers and sisters. There's a lot going on, and it seems to be that you know the Jewish people we have gains. Sometimes it's two steps, you know, it's one step forward and two steps back. So I think there's a lot of things that we Jews thought were already fixed and given and okay, and now we're getting a lot of surprises in a lot of areas. Uh, one, one thing that you know, I'm sure you've read about, there's a lot of trouble on college campuses. There's certain, there's certain problems in the job market that's supposed to be gone. There's problems with Israel we didn't expect. A lot of things we thought were gone and coming back. And of course the world goes in cycles, but when you sit in a pace like Seder, sometimes a person could be real cynical and say, you know what, what's the point? What's the point? All this talk about redemption and geula, where did it get us? We Jews, we get redeemed, we're back in trouble. We get, they like us, they don't like us. Well, what's the point? It's like a, a never, it's a never, never going, never ending circle. So a person could get frustrated and figure, you know, what, 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 what good did I do over here? What, what, what is it? People work hard to support their, their mishpachas and to overcome everything in life. And sometimes things happen that, like, you just absolutely, you know, how can, you can't believe such a thing. How could this happen to me? How could it happen to the Jewish people? How could somebody do such a thing like that? So, everybody talks about this. And as Rabbi Weinberg, of blessed memory from their Israel, said, there's not too many new questions. Maybe a few. But a lot of them, if you look, if you look, you don't have to even look so hard, you could find them. And this question was nagging Jewish people for years. Because they had the same, whatever jewelry you want to take, Spanish jewelry, British jewelry, there always were these ups and downs, and everything looked okay, looked like the Jews are going to be accepted, and then bang, things start all over again. All, uh, all over again. I mean, I was thinking over Shabbos about the British. We have such a love-hate relationship with the British. They, historically, I think they're just about the first nation to really have bloody bloody pogrom and crusade nature things against the Jewish people in 11, 1200s. And then there are times where they recognize the state of Israel. They don't recognize the state of Israel. They're a hate. And you read during the Holocaust, many Jews, England was the haven. And even Churchill's very, very complicated. I don't think it's as complicated as Roosevelt was. I think the weight of Churchill's actions is for the Jews, but there were a few things he did, like, you just don't know if you're coming or going. So the Jews always have this issue, you know, what's really the point? Am I ever going to really be redeemed? Is the whole thing a waste if they're going to bother me again anyway? Old question, different flavor. So, let's see, somebody, the the Divrei Shaul, the Divrei Shaul had a name. His name was Rabbi Joseph Saul Nathanson. In Yiddish, his name comes out really funky, but we'll just call him Nathanson. That's what it would be in, in English. He says like this. Well, he goes, look at it this way. Look at it this way. And there's a lot of different parables. Everybody has to find what we're, you know, what, uh, what, what's going to work for them. you got to find what's going to work for them. Uh, I just want to mention, I recently, with the help of Dr. Sh- Steve Schwartz, is that his name? The eye doctor here? Yeah. Dr. Steve Schwartz, I gave a series on great Jews and sports, also with the help of some of your nice library. And we were talking about Hank Greenberg, because you can't talk about great Jews and sport if you don't talk about Hank as Hank as Greenberg. And there's a fantastic documentary about him. He's on it, his kids are on it, his friends are on it. And they interviewed some of his non-Jewish players, that he, uh, buddies, 
And they said, it's not coming from a Jew, they said Detroit didn't deserve Hank. Because when he hit home runs and he did a good play at first base, they loved him. But he made a mistake, all the nasty Jewish diatribes that any other player would get would get. So here you have a man, you know, he was the top of his field, he was a star, almost broke Babe Ruth's record, and you know, when they loved him, they loved him, and they weren't happy. Ah, you lousy Jew, all over again. So, you know, the question just keeps haunting us, you know, when's there going to be an end to this already? You know, redeem me, chosen people, chosen for, you know, it happens. Hopefully we don't get it as bad as maybe some other people do, our ancestors did, but it comes up. So Rabbi Nathanson says, well, try thinking of it this way, and you can find 20 different parables. He said there was a man that really, really wasn't doing well. He was on poverty level, he was uneducated, he never got a chance, had to leave school early, and he just had a pretty miserable life. Felt very down, downtrodden upon. Well, he made a good deal, because we all know that's all it takes, especially in the music world, right? You make a one-hit wonder, you could be set for life, right? After Queen made We Will, We Will Rock You, they could have gone and learned in Kylo, you know, I mean, that was it. You know, once you had that song, or the not not goodbye thing, they played all the baseball games. I don't think those people ever had another hit. I think they're still living off the interest. But this guy made one good investment, and he's got plenty of money. And as the Jeffersons say, he's moving on up. Got a new car, whatever they had, new wagon back then, new Conestoga, whatever it was, a new house, everything's going great. And he says, I'm going to get an education. I'm going to catch up. And he got himself private tutors, and he became a very educated man, and he is living the life of Riley and Rockefeller all put together. But we know what goes up must come down, spinning wheel, turn round and round. Stock market crashed, whatever it was, thing didn't go so well, lost everything. Now, he had a custom that every year on the anniversary of his good investment, he made a party. And he kept making the party after his downfall. And his buddies, whatever he had, I guess he used to serve crepes, Suzette, and caviar, and now he's, uh, and Manischewitz something, and now he's uh, serving, you know, kichel and abyssal herring. So he said, what are you celebrating for? It's over. It's over. What do you mean? You're back where you started. Who knows? Maybe worse. Why celebrate? He says, listen, I lost the money. I lost the house. I lost the wagon. But you know what? I'm a different person. Rabbi David Hoffman from the Yeshiva I teach in Baltimore stressed it this way. I'm not the same person. I changed. I got educated. I got to live a better life for a while. I am a different person. I'm not that downtrodden Nebuch that I started out as. I have an education. I have a view on life. I see what it's all about. And you can't take that away from me. You could take all kinds of other things away from me, but I am a different person now, and I celebrate that. So Rabbi Nathanson suggests that when Jews have their ups and downs, they've got to remind themselves that there's a lot of things people could take away from us. You want to get into Harvard, and the quota knocks you out. You want a certain job, and uh, no Jews need apply, which, which that is coming back in some areas. You can't really stay in that hotel. You know what? Fine. Let it go, let it go. But since the Jew, through the Jewish experience and the receiving of the Torah, the Jews have, seen, have gained certain qualities, and we have a right to be happy about that. They can't take everything away from us. Certain things about being a Jew, I still got out of the Egypt experience, the Torah experience, and 10,000 other experiences as being a Jew, so I still can feel good about that. I still got work to do. So anyway, that's just one view that he says... Some people speak, uh, say parables about medical conditions, but everybody has to find you know, what, what's going to work for them to see how life can be up and down and up and down for the Jews. But there's still a point. Just, uh, just uh, another way to look at it so that we Jews feel a little better. This, by the way, is an example of uh, I Will Survive. This Haggadah, you probably saw his one on Chumash. 
If you ever looked at Wellsprings of Torah by Rabbi Alexander Zusha Friedman, so that's him, Mayana Shel Torah, Wellsprings of Torah. He originally wrote it in Yiddish, the Torah Kvel, the Torah Wellspring. So he wrote on the Chumash, he wrote on the Haggadah, probably wrote on other things also. Didn't live that long, he was killed by the Nazis. So he's gone, but his writings, his writings live on. And you may be connected to him another way. If even once in your life, you read something from Sefer HaTodaa, the Book of Heritage, by Rabbi Aliyahu Kitov, that's his brother-in-law. Now Rabbi Kitov's real name was Kitavowitz. Just like Golda Meir's real name wasn't Golda Meir, what happened was she came... Her maiden name was Mabowitz. She married Moish Meyerson, and when she got a job in the, in the Israeli cabinet, so first Moshe Sharet said, all of a shalom, said to her, listen, you're in the cabinet, you really should make a more Israeli name than Meyerson. So she didn't pay attention to him. Later on, when Golda Shalom became the foreign minister, Ben Gurion said, listen, you're a foreign minister, you really should have an Israeli name. You can keep the gold. Uh, it doesn't have to be Zahava. I don't know. Maybe they did call her that. But, but uh, he says, you really got to change the name. So she figured, okay, I'll be Meir. You know, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll change the Meir. But a lot of people, when they go to Israel, they like to Hebraize their name. So the one who, his brother-in-law, Rabbi Kita, was originally Ketavowitz. He was a Kleisenberger chassid. But, and he's a very, very, he was a very, very prolific writer, a very dynamic person. And his writing and his lectures were incredible. And he used to tell people, I can't hold a candle to my brother-in-law, Rabbi Friedman, whose life was taken. Very, very big Jewish activist. Did a lot for our people before they took him. So we don't have him, but we have his, we have his writings and whatever he did for us. Now, for you, I have a rule. For your birthday, always drop hints to your family of books you might like, okay? My wife's got it down to a science. I think she wakes me up in the middle of the night and gets me to talk what I want. So for my birth, most recent birthday, Mrs. Karp decided I needed Rabbi Soloveitchik's Haggadah by his wow. student, Rabbi Gross, a rabbi from Teaneck. So we know this rabbi is not only well-learned by Rabbi Soloveitchik, if he's from Teaneck, David, he's well-fed. <laughs> he must have eaten Noah's Ark cuisine at least one, you ever go there? <laughs> at least once. Teaneck is the capital of Jew. I'm sure there's Tyra there, too. The rabbi, Rabbi Yosef, Al Adler, I said, gross, I'm sorry. He's a, he's a rub in Teaneck over there. So anyway, my wife got me this lovely, lovely Haggadah from Rabbi Soloveitchik. And the great, you know, it, you know, Rabbi Wine has a saying, history will decide. You know, people say that. He probably didn't invent that. But, you know, history will decide. Because there's so many men and women that when they were alive, they were controversial. Then they pass on, and all of a sudden, everybody loves them. You know, they're okay. They're politically correct. Not everybody. Let's give you an example. The, the Rambam, you know, they burned his books. Orthodox people burned his books. They wanted to excommunicate him. There was a period they thought he wasn't even religious. And, then, and they went and they checked him out. And now, who questions Maimonides? People like Maimonides, right? He's the savior of all rationalist Jews, right? People love him, right? Take Rabbi Lutzato. Almost most Jewish homes have at least one book from Rabbi Lutzato, or they've heard him. In his time, that Italian rabbi was such an outcast. I don't know if they burned his books, they wanted to burn his books, they drove him crazy. Was not a practicing rabbi a good part of his life. Didn't always go with a beard. Had an awful lot of enemies. Nobody ever dreamed that he would be the absolute paragon of the ethics and Muslim movement, a book that absolutely is used, used by just about anybody and everybody. So I'm saying Rabbi Soloveitchik in his time was a great man, but, you know, still, you know, uh, as we all know, Jews, uh, our favorite thing is not to agree. So, uh, you know, in his time, he could be a little bit controversial. He didn't do anything wrong, but, but he could be a little bit controversial. 
uh, something I think around here to us is a positive. He was a bigger Zionist than a lot of other rabbis in his own way, and he uh, told the other rabbis what's going on with secular education. Yeah, Torah is everything, but secular education is something too. And he even was bold enough to say, and that depends who you, and watch out who you say this in front of when you're driving around. Rabbi Soloveitchik said, there are certain parts of the Torah, if you don't have a secular education, including secular philosophy, you don't know what the Torah is talking about. Now, Mr. Cohen, you know certain streets in Muncie, you say that, <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna do what to David Cohen, even though you're all a big, strong, handsome guy, right? <laughs> Mr. Vechik didn't care. He called it the way it was. As a matter of fact, I'll throw you a real curveball. He supposedly said one time, "You should study a little bit of Kant." Is it Kant or Kant? K A N T. It is what? Kant. I always get these wrong. That's I'm asking you. Kant. Yeah, right, right, right. Mr. Vechik said. You need, you need some of that. It'll help you understand parts of the Torah. The Chassam Seifer studied Kant also. <laughs> all right? He didn't give it out to all the students, but he studied it. So I'm just trying to tell you, in his time, you know, people accepted, didn't accept, half accepted. Uh, it's a shame when I was in yeshiva, there were boys. I don't know where they picked up this garbage. They would refer to him as JB, not as rabbi. Which, which is absolute disgrace. And I don't know where this garbage comes from. But in the meanwhile now, he's gone, and everybody's quoting him. Everybody, you know, it's, it's just funny how history hashes, uh, hashes things out. There are a lot of people like that. But anyway, Rabbi said, I just, no, no, I know it's every pace so that people have a lot to do. That's what I'm telling you in bites, so if people have to run, I can speak to the people in the studio audience. So the Levitchik asked a very simple grammatical question, right? Because we know that, that in Judaism you can say all kinds of neat interpretations, but you shouldn't drift too far from the words. The Hasidim like to drift a little bit hard from the words, but um, you always got to come back to the words, because the Talmud says, Ein mikra yotzei midei pshuto. You're not supposed to pull a verse out of its simple meaning. Whatever interpretation you say, at the end of the day, most of the time, except for maybe two places, you, you got to fit it into the words. And I want to mention to you, my Rebbe, by Moshe Hillel Glazer, who I wish I could bring him up here one of these days, he's a Asbury Park, New Jersey fellow. Um, he, a few years ago, wrote a, a commentary on Chumash, and his nephew told me one of the reasons he wrote it is because... Uh, he's a little bit disappointed that he feels that there are some people that are pushing the envelope too much. And he feels, you know, there's Emmis and there's Emmis. So, he, so he, he, he's heard some interpretations that he felt were a bit stretching it. Now, it's one thing if you want to say interpretation and stretch it and tell everybody you're stretching it, that's one thing. But if you say it, you want to say, I'm right and nobody else is, that, that's a different story. So, Salvechik is a very, very simple question. Early in the Haggadah, we quote a pasuk. God tells Avraham, "Vagam esagoi asher yavodu," and also the nation which the Jews will serve. And there's all kinds of discussion: who is that nation supposed to be? Because it doesn't say Egypt. So you could talk about that. But every people talk about that. But he tells Abraham, and also the nation which the Jews shall serve, Don or Nochi. I shall judge and afterwards the Jews will go out with great treasure so we know the Jews got two physical treasures they got to borrow permanently all kinds of nice things from the Egyptian neighbors and they got things at the Yamsuf at the Red Sea and they got the, the spiritual treasure of the Torah alright, very nice, everybody knows that right, so Beitchik says I have a problem and you don't have to be an Israeli gram uh, grammarian to know this. Dan is not really the right word. I will judge in Hebrew is not Dan Anochi. That's not it. The correct way to say I will judge is Aleph, Dalid, Cholem, Nun. Because Aleph is I 
and don't is to judge. I am going to judge them. Rabbi Soloveitchik says, if you are a judge presiding over a courtroom situation, it's not proper Hebrew to say Don. It just isn't. And there's, not, there's no two opinions about it. So he says, but it's in the Torah. And uh, the, Torah is, uh, the, the Torah is very exacting in its words after years and years of scribes checking. So Rabbi Soloveitchik says, what's up? So he says, I'm going to tell you what's up. Simple Hebrew, the difference between Adon, not Adon, Master, Adon, I will judge, and the word Don, judge. Adon means I am the judge, I'm the judicial presence, I sit over the case, and I'm going to decide and render decisions. Don is a word you use when you're in the case. When you're a litigant in the case, that is the kind of judging word you use in Hebrew. So what's the message? When that falls, we know God is the ultimate judge. And Soloveitchik says, Hashem's message to the Jewish people is, I'm suffering with you, and I'm by your side. And when Moses goes to argue on your behalf to Paro, I'm like the lawyer going with him. It's as if, uh, not as if, it's more than if, I'm suffering too. I, and, and I'm judging it from a litigant's, almost from a, from a victim's perspective, and I'm right there with you in the trenches. So Rabbi Salvation says, of course Hashem is the ultimate judicial presence. But Hashem wants Avram to know that when the Jews suffer, the message of the burning bush, Imo Anochi Batsara, I'm with, I'm with the Jews there in the Tzaras. I'm in that thorn bush. Hashem says, I just want you to know, yeah, I am the ultimate judge, but I'm also a litigant, a victim, and I'm looking at the situation, suffering together with you. And I'm like a lawyer standing there. So he just is saying all this because we have to understand that it's not like God should be in the distance viewing uh, from the telescope. He says, I'm right there with you, and I'm going to be there with you. And a lot of times it looks like I'm not there at all, but I'm there. So he says, that's something we need to think about, that Don is more like a lawyer, litigant person in the case, which is a different which is a different experience. And the Jews have to understand that. Very, very hard to understand that. Rabbi Chaim Velazhiner, the Vilna Gaon's number one student, says uh, a concept it's a little bit tough to understand, but if you think about it, it makes sense. He said when we daven, very often we're, we're not davening right. He goes, what do I mean? When I daven, I daven for me, I daven for my family, I daven for my friends. He says, I want you to put something higher on your list. And he writes pages about this. The Baal Shem Tov writes about it too. He says, you need to say in your heart, God... I am suffering because of whatever is going on in my life. I know this gives you a headache too. So for your sake and for my sake, could you rectify it? Because I feel bad for you also. Now it sounds funny. You say, what do you mean? You're telling God to heal himself. You're telling God to have him to yourself. But Reb Chaim Velazhner says, no, 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 no. You need, he goes, I'm telling you, show God a little empathy and say, I know that if I'm hurting, you're hurting too. And for your sake, you know, let's make a change. It's a little bit like, you remember, when the daddy takes out the strap and says, oh, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. So the smart kid says, so don't do it. <laughs> All right, but it's just that idea that sometimes things have to happen for a while, but there's still a certain amount of pain to the parent. So he says, Hashem is the same thing. Now, it's a, now I don't know exactly how the concept works, but Rabbi Chaim Velazhner says that should be in a person's program to say to Hashem, I'm in pain. I know you have a certain amount of pain over this also, so the sooner you get rid of the problem, you won't be in pain either. So it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing because we're not used to God having all these kind of needs and emotions. It may not be needy like you and I, but he says there's such a thing as showing concern for Hashem that you're in pain too, you should do something about it. So Rai Svejic says that's why it says Don, making God a participant, not just an outsider. So it's amazing from one word. He was amazing in Yeshiva University. 
he could talk about a question from an co- early commentary. He could spend four hours giving you the background on it. It was incredible. It was an incredible, incredible, th- incredible, incredible thinker from a lot of great thinkers. Okay, so I want to share with you one more thing. My father told me, and I think it's still basically true, that in Europe, a large percentage of the people were poverty level. That's the way it was. That's the way it was. Rabbi Wani Shalivin Ruel says that many of the movements, the isms that Jews were the head of, so there's a lot of reasons for that, but he says one of the reasons so many Jews were the head and heavily involved in so many of the isms was because they were looking for a better life. Because the Jews just couldn't go on starving and being oppressed. One of the greatest examples was Sidney Hillman. Sidney Hillman was the big man from the unions. Oh, I always get the initials wrong. I-L-G-U-W. He was from the garment union all the way back. Big, 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 big man. Even Roosevelt, who had a love-hate relationship with the Jews, he used to say, don't do anything without asking Sidney. He had a respect for him. But Sidney Hillman started out yeshiva boy in Slobodka, and he was a Russian revolutionary. He was thrown in prison, and then he became here and became a labor leader. And if you ever read even a little bit about Sidney Hillman, his Hebrew name was Simcha. He made changes in the United States work world that affect us to today. Very, very, very great man in, uh, in, in, in many ways. But the bottom line was, as my father told me, and as you probably read, Europe was pretty poor. Very rough. I know the stories make it look nice, and it was nice, but as my daddy said, you don't want to go back to the shtetl. It was dirty, it was poor, it was sad, it was dangerous. It wasn't the idyllic... I mean, stories are nice, they make you feel good. You know, there were, there were good things, but it wasn't the idyllic... I mean, you know, like, people like to read Helm stories. And, you know, and, and tell you the milkman. It's all nice, but remember, I mean, uh, at Penwich Virgin you saw, in Fiddler on the Roof, there's a scene there where the Russian Cossacks come in and bust up the, we- you know, the wedding after all the nice klezmer music. But my father told me, though, there was something about Pesach things were better. My father told me a whole year, you didn't really have much to eat. Sometimes you went to sleep without without at all. Your clothes were shmatas. My father said, up to when he left in the late 30s from Europe, my father said, there's no hot water in the house, the poorer Jews. Outhouses, late 30s. I know there's places in Maryland and Tillman Island that were that way too, but the, uh, I think that's maybe their own fault, this, but whatever. Won't judge East, Eastern... Uh, don't worry, it's, it, it's, it's over the bridge. You're, you're safe, you're safe. But my father told me, though, why was Pesach better? Because there were relatives from America that would send. They would send you money, they would send you supplies. At least once year they would send you. Sukkot, so-so. Shavuot, so-so. Shabbos, hit and miss. Nice chala, not nice chala. Half a chala, meat, not meat. Pesach, my father said. The house was glowing. The little shack was glowing. So it seems to be there's something about Pesach that Jews reach out to Jews. If you look at Jewish Civil War history, like from Bertram Korn, I think his name was, there were stories where in the middle of the war, um, Jews in the North and South helped each other. It was against the law. Ticked off Grant, almost threw us out of the army. The Lincoln stopped them. But, you know, there was something about Pesach. So... It could be that it all started with something Rabbi Soloveitchik points out. We know before the Jews are going to leave, Hashem tells Moshe, tell the Jews, go borrow, quotes, go borrow from the Egyptians some nice things. The Gemara Sanhedrin spends time on what kind of borrowing that was over there. Basically, it was back pay for 210 years of uncompensated slavery. But okay, you can look at that Gemara and Sanhedrin. But whatever, the Jews are supposed to borrow from their neighbors. Okay, the exact wording is Daber no ba'azneyaha Maisha, please speak in the ears of the people and tell them to borrow a man from his neighbor, a woman from her neighbor, kli kesev a kli zahav, garments, jewelry of silver and gold. Okay, fine. So Rabbi Salvechik, once again, one word, he, his curiosity is piqued by the word please. 
And even without the word please, he could say what he wants to say. It just gives Nacha another push. Please. He goes, listen, these Egyptians, what they did to us for all these years, they could give me something. He wants to know what exactly was going on with those pleas. Is it that the Jews were bashful? Not so sure about that. They have, they have every right to ask. So he says, I'm going to tell you what happened. And even you can say this without the word please. Let's think a little bit. You had Jews who lived in Goshen. That's where they lived. Now to me, and to David, Goshen is Goshen, New York. Goshen, New York <laughs> is the birthplace of harness horse racing. And you're thinking, who cares? I grew up in Monticello, New York, which is Monticello Raceway. My father used to work for the track. My mother was not a better. My mother was a Zeigenzun, bet one time. Win, play, show. My mother bet 250, lost the money, and started crying. God bless my mother. But whatever it is, uh, I, I grew, if, if you lived in Monticello, New York, you grew up around a horse racing, whether you went to the track or not. So Goshen, New York, there's a nice museum there with a little track. That's where Harness, not the one on the back like Bimlico and the Kentucky Derby, the Harness horse racing something. But Goshen, New York, comes from Goshen, Egypt, where the Jews were. So my situation says, let's think. You had different Jews living in different neighborhoods. Now, you had some Jews that had, had decent neighbors. And those Egyptians shopped at the Egyptian Macy's, the Egyptian Lomans, the Egyptian Gimbals. And if the Jews borrowed from them, they got some neat things. They got some neat things to go out to the desert. But there were some other Jews, I don't know if they lived on Tobacco Road or Skid Row or Harlem, I don't know, whatever neighborhood you want. But their neighbors... They got their things in Target and the dollar store. And if the Jews wanted something really exciting to go out to march in the desert to Mount Sinai, it was slim pickings. So what happened? You know, so Rachel says, I'm going to tell you what, what had to have happened. The Jews come back from their Jewish trick-or-treating. You see, we started everything. They come back from their Jewish trick-or-treating, borrowing things, borrowing things. And some Jews says, wow, look what I got. Oh, look at this. And some other Jews, uh, I got uh, Loretta Lynn's rhinestones over here from the, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know what to do. I got, uh, what do I have over here? I have an apron that says Eat a Joe, so I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So Rasevichik says, Moshe told the Jews, he says, the Pusik that says, please ask your neighbor, he says, that doesn't have to be Jews going to the Egyptian, that's Jews going to Jews. He says, included in all this is Moshe had to tell the Jews, you Jews, when you went to borrow, you didn't get much or nothing that impressive. Go over to Jews that got good things and ask them to share. And by so Lechik says, you have to understand what a big deal it is. He says, slave mentality, or anyone that's had a really, really, really cruddy job, when you get out of that job, and you had nothing, when you have something, you don't want to give it up, especially a slave. A slave has next to nothing. So he says, slave mentality, when you get out of slavery, whatever you get, mine, I'm not sharing this. I never read anything. Now I have something. So Hashem told Moshe, Jewish people, it's not going to work. They must learn to share immediately. You can't have your own carbon Pesach. You must share with family and friends. That's the rule. Right now, right after they got that nice piece of clothing, tell the Jews it didn't do so well. Go over to the other Jews. And no, please, please. It's a little uncomfortable, but can I please have one of those dresses and one of those nice robes you got? Just one? So it's going to be hard for the asker. It's going to be hard for the giver. But Rabbi Salvation says the Jews needed to become givers right away or they're going to fall into the mentality. So it's good for both sides. It's therapeutic for one, and it's honorable for the other. Now, I can't say for sure, but maybe, 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 this first case of Jew reaching out to Jew, maybe it planted a seed for the future, that on Passover time, Jews are a little bit more giving, and I just, I, I can't do it justice to my, my father, to my father's face. 
You know, my father told me my father had survivor's guilt because my father had three sisters and a brother, and his parents. They all were killed. I'm not sure if they were killed by the uh, by the SS or the Polish. He doesn't know exactly where they're buried. Uh, I believe there are maybe in a mass grave under a Polish mall. Jews protested, but you, you, you know those kind of stories. And uh, it was very, very hard for my father because there was one brother that was supposed to come, but a relative stole his visa and gave it to somebody else. So you can imagine every day my father was... Uh, but my father told me one thing. He says, when it comes to Pesach, he says, Pesach was so beautiful in our house because our Uncle Sam used to send us money from America. Thank God. He says, on Pesach, everybody comes alive life for me for that night. And that night I have a little less survivor's guilt. I see everybody again, and we all look beautiful and nice clothes, well fed. But the rest of the year, forget it. So who knows? Maybe it all started back then. Uh, everybody should have a beautiful Passover. I know you have a million things to do. And have a nice time with your family and friends.